You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Lots of people dream of retiring at an early age so they can spend time pursuing other activities that they like better. Creating passive income with real estate can make that happen, but you also need to know how much money you'll need to pay for it all in the end. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. In this episode, you'll hear from an investor with some great advice for people who want to streamline their plans and make it easier to reach their goals. Our guest today, Kathy Gottberg, talks about right-sizing your lifestyle as opposed to downsizing so you can do the things you want and have more free time. Kathy and her husband, Tom, got rid of their oversized home, the extra cars, and put that money they saved into real estate investments for decades. The payoff? They have enough passive income to pay for the travel they want to do and other pursuits. And she's here today to show us how she's done it. So Kathy, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Well, hi, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Oh, likewise. Now you are the author of seven books and you've been writing for over 35 years. That's incredible. And you've also been investing in real estate. So let's start with your real estate story and how you how you got started. <laughs> um, my husband and I, uh, we, we got together a long time ago. We've actually, we just uh, celebrated our 45th oh. anniversary of, of when we met. Oh, congratulations. Year, thank you. Thank you. And this year will be our 45th wedding anniversary. Um, and right from the beginning, we decided we weren't cut out to do the traditional. So uh, we've been working for ourselves. Um, we started out with a few small businesses that we got into and got out of. Um, and before we knew it, we were living in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and we started investing in real estate, buying little rental properties um, and flipping them. And because we didn't really have another job to rely on, we were living on flipping pretty much. And that worked for us. So of course, I decided I had to get my real estate license and then my broker's license so that we could buy our own properties and uh, keep on investing. And then my husband got into it too, um, because it just seemed like a good thing to do. And it gives us, well, as you know, the real estate lifestyle has so much to offer everybody. But along the way, I've stayed a broker. We didn't want to give up the license once I got that. Um, and we still we still invest in real estate. We still have real estate. Um, and like I said, real estate's been a very important part of our lives. So it's kind of like real estate and writing are, are really important to me. Okay. Um, so one of the things that you write about is right-sizing. So tell me what you mean by that. <laughs> we didn't really, uh, we didn't stumble onto it until probably about, um, 12 years ago, I think, and I was writing about the environment and, and environmental issues and you know how the need for sustainability was becoming more and more popular and important, at least to us. And at the time, then the real estate crisis hit 2008, and we kind of saw that, you know, that train wreck happening. And we thought, you know, we got to kind of cut back. We were relying at the time mostly on Tom's income from commercial real estate. So um, first off, we started looking at our lifestyle and we're, um, we don't have any children. There's just the two of us. We had managed to buy a very nice house in a very nice neighborhood. We had a three car garage filled with vehicles, three cars and two motorcycles. <laughs> and we had all this stuff. And we just like they said, is that what we want for our life? We also hit like um, our 50s. And I think that when you hit your 50s, you start... Uh, looking around a little differently at your lifestyle. And that's kind of what, hit, you know, we've been doing real estate traditionally for quite a while where, you know, you just keep wanting more and building more and buying a fancier house and more stuff and more investments and more things like that. And finally, we were like, you know, maybe that's not, it's like the ladder is against the wrong wall and it's time to put it against a wall that really suits what is important to you. So somewhere along the line, I started writing about um, right-sizing because right-sizing to me is a process where you sit down and you get really clear about what's important to you. Now, the most obvious thing is your house, your personal life, where you live, um, you know, what, what's important to you as far as you know, where, uh, what, what location you live in, 
what you do with your money and what you do with your time and your resources. And that's what it's been. It's, a, it's been a voyage of discovering, of you know, clarifying what's really important to my husband and I's lifestyle. And what do we want to do with the rest of the time we have left? Um, because it is not an endless resource. At some point, <laughs> at some point, we're going to have to uh, realize that. So right sizing has been very good to us. And when I wrote the book about right sizing, and then um, put it out there for people to, you know, to, to um, read, they resonated with it because I think there's a lot of us, especially the title of the book is A Right Sizing uh, Guide to Reinventing Retirement. And at, at the time in our 50s, we weren't anywhere near close to being ready to retire. And now we are in our 60s, but we don't necessarily need to retire. We call ourselves semi-retired. Um, I'm still writing. Tom is still working. Um, and what, I think when you love what you do, you don't have to run away from it. You're not looking to get, you know, I know so many people that have worked corporate jobs that they don't really like and they can't wait to retire. Mm -hmm. Well, when you love what you do and you have all the freedom in the world to do it, you don't need to leave it or get away from it. So that's where that reinventing retirement comes. Um, so right sizing is just a a formula or a, a process to use to design the kind of life that works for you. There's no set, you know, it's like, okay, if you don't do it the way I do it, then you're doing it wrong. It's not that at all. It's doing it in a way that really serves you and, and fits your needs. I love that. And I couldn't agree more how important it is to get focused on the why, why, you know, and also planning. I'm I'm in my 50s now too, and and it's a time to say, well, how much time do I have? Am I halfway through? Am I? I mean, none mm -hmm. of us has any guarantee, no matter what the age, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but it is it is so important to put those big rocks in first, um, exactly the that matter most. Uh, right. Make sure they're scheduled in because it's amazing how the not so important stuff can take priority. I just, um, well, in, in my blog post, I write a lot about this stuff. Time is very important to me right now. And uh, there's a, a new book out called 4,000 Weeks. And the, the idea behind it is the average lifestyle, a, a lifetime is only 4,000 weeks. So what are you doing with your weeks, you know? And when you hit kind of what you consider a halfway mark, and then you start thinking about 2,000 weeks, oh, that doesn't sound very long at all. And then, you know, if you start whittling in that down, what are we spending our time on? Where, you know, what's important to us? And, yeah. you know, I, real estate has been the, the solution for us in so many really good ways. I've kind of checked out your website, um, getting ready and listened to some of your other podcasts. And I think it's a, a very strong theme that you have going. A real wealth to me means uh, focusing on what matters, focusing on what really brings you that joy and that freedom. Well, freedom and peace um, of mind and, and uh, just simplicity is very important to my husband and I. And that to me is real wealth. Mm. Yeah, I, when we moved to Malibu, uh, we just came for a little while and it was during the, the recession. So it was actually very cheap to live in Malibu because almost most places were empty. Um, so we could rent for very cheap. But this then our daughter went to school and was around some of the wealthiest people in the world. And what we learned and what she learned, particularly because she was inside these mansions and uh, with these families a lot. Uh, was that money didn't bring happiness necessarily. And if if anything, she noticed that with, within these big mansions, the family couldn't find each other. Like the kids were on their own separate wings and the parents on their others. And then oftentimes they were traveling and it was the 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 maids that were cooking. And, and that family unit was getting further and further apart. And we were renting this little tiny condo and I was cooking. <laughs> and so the, the kids would come there because they could get a homemade meal and you could find your family. So yeah, it's it's so important to just boil it down to you no know, it, it what 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 do you really want and how do you want to spend your time? Absolutely. Right. But you also bring up a, a kind of another important thing. I think it really matters who you decide to hang out with. Um 
you know, in the case of your daughter, luckily she was seeing the downside of all that money without um, being sucked into it. I call it lifestyle creep. Have you heard of lifestyle creep? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So lifestyle creep is where, you know, you just start getting used to these little perks in your life. You know, that latte, you know, once in a while suddenly turns into that Starbucks latte every day. And before you know it, you're spending three or $400 a month going to Starbucks. And that's crazy. Um, but it's really, I think, I, unfortunately, I think it's really epidemic in our country where people have just gotten used to, you know, um, signing up for their cable. And before they know it, they have 5,000 channels that who can watch 5,000 channels, <laughs> you know, and yet you're paying all this money for things that sound like they're important and you've gotten used to having, um, but you don't really need. And then if you hang out with other people who are always buying the latest car and the latest tech, of course, I do like technology, so I can't really put put the finger at that. But if you need the latest of anything and you're constantly buying things, it's a lifestyle creep and it's going to suck up your money instead of being able to invest it um, and, and be able to live off those investments is so important. Absolutely. All right. So reimagining re- retirement, you already mentioned that, but um, I think what you're saying, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of times when people do, they dream of the day they retire and then sometimes find themselves a bit bored and still you know, lacking purpose. Mm-hmm. So uh, is that part of the reimagining retirement for you? I think so. I think, um, I think the biggest, the biggest thing I mentioned before, it's realizing that retirement isn't something that you you know, finally, when I retire, I'm going to finally be happy. It's like, why are you delaying your happiness and your peace of mind and, you know, the things that matter to you until, you know, that time in the future when you hope to finally walk away from it. Instead, create, create it as you're going. Um, don't, don't wait until the end. And I, I, like I said, I find too many people out there that have delayed um, the, the good in their life for that magic moment in the future. And, and my encouragement would be don't, if you hate your job, don't stay in it. There are other things to do. I mean, I know it can be challenging and I know I've had advantages, but I didn't come from a wealthy family. I don't have a pension. Um, my husband and I were um, entrepreneurs from the beginning. So we, you know, our investments in real estate is our entire re- uh, retirement. Mm-hmm. Um, and but but we've worked at them hard enough um, and focused not hard because that implies right sizing sounds a lot like downsizing like sacrifice like a, you have to give up stuff and I don't see right sizing in that light at all I see it as more the focus on what really matters to you and then doing that and when you're doing what you really care about you're not sacrificing things so instead of working at jobs you just like um, you know I think. Tom's example in his commercial real estate business is when he was able to stop working with people he really didn't like. And, you know, hey, in any yeah. profession, there are people in there you really don't like, but in sometimes you feel like you have to work with them. Um, and he, he was able to get to the point where now he only works with, with a very few select clients. Um, and obviously that's a joy. They're more like friends than they are, you know, drudgery. Um, and yet, uh, I mean, we all heard, we all know stories of people who do work with people that they don't care for, at jobs that they don't care for. Mm-hmm. So, re- um, reimagining right side uh, retirement is just getting away with the whole picture of thinking. And plus, we're all living longer, which is a wonderful thing. But to think that you're just going to stop working at a certain age and not have anything else to contribute to, you know, your life or other people, or the planet, or anything like that is is a little bit crazy, I think. So there's a lot of books being written right now about the idea of retiring early, even, um, is the idea of, like, what are you going to do with yourself? I mean, if it's just to play golf, and I kind of do know some people, (laughs) that's what they're hoping for, but to me, that would drive me crazy. Just to play golf all day. I want want, um, to contribute and be more a part of life um, than that. And that again, is all part of that re- uh, reinventing retire. And, and again, it's, it all comes down to what brings you great joy. If, if, if that brings you great joy, then wonderful. 
Um, I, I do know a lot of people who have retired and lived that dream of golfing every day. And after a <laughs> while, it doesn't take, it's not right away, but after three, four, five years, they're done and, and mm-hmm. ready for a new, new challenge, a new adventure. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so with your, your, like me, somebody who has a history in real estate that many of our listeners don't have. Um, many of our listeners have maybe only paid attention for the past 10 years, let's say. And it's been a really good time to be in real estate, right? It's been an incredible up up market. Um, what was your life like and what was real estate investing like during the down markets that you experienced? Well, I'd say if anything, it taught us that it's always a cycle that there's always going to be a boom and there will probably be some kind of a bust. Now, I doubt we'll see anything like 2008, um, but the last couple of years have really surprised us. We we did not expect it based upon um, our own previous history. But we tend to, especially at our age, I think we changed. Um, as we've gotten older, our um, goals and, you know, desires for the future are different than what they were so now we mostly are uh, safety first Um, everything we own is free and clear Um, and that's really important to us because we're into it for the cash flow not the um, my husband likes to say um, don't focus on net worth focus on net cash flow Um, figure out what you can live um, what kind of cash flow will give you the kind of life you want Um, and then create um, you know, investments that create that. And I think you guys do that with your company, um, with Real Wealth. Well, we do, but it's harder and harder today to get the cash flow that you're getting, for example, because what you paid is is less than what people are paying today, but you own the assets. So so people who already own the assets, they're, you know, that's that's a great position to be in. But if you're just acquiring, you're really not going to be sitting on a lot of cash flow. So um, you know, it's harder and harder to find those distressed properties and to fix them up. I mean, the opportunity is out there, but it's definitely not what it was just a few years ago and certainly not what it was 10 years ago. Uh, so what would be your advice to people just starting out now when prices are high and inventory is low and there's competition everywhere and, um, and it's not, it's not, it's not going to cash flow that well in the beginning, especially if you finance, but some people need it. Not everyone can pay cash. I think that's why right-sizing works so well with it. Um, When we first decided to right-size our lives, what we did is, um, like I said, we were living in a very nice house, had all the toys and bells and whistles and things like that. And what we decided is we sat down, and this is something I advise everybody to do right from the beginning if they're interested in right-sizing, is to um, do like a little T-shirt chart where you sit down and you figure out what is your lifestyle as it is costing you and how important is that? You know, now I get that some people need a big house. They have children and they have grandchildren or, you know, and they, they need a big house for that purposes. But when there's two of you, mm, I'm not so sure you need that big house. Um, and three, three cars with two motorcycles, I, you can only drive one at a time. Do you really need those? And how, how much enjoyment are you getting out of them? We live in the um, La Quinta, which is by Palm Springs, and everybody has a swimming pool. And we, I had to have a swimming pool, of course. That's just what everybody does. Mm-hmm. But when we counted up how many times we actually got in the swimming pool, because we didn't heat it that often, and when it was cold, I didn't, I had no interest in getting in the swimming pool. So we figured the times we were in that swimming pool was maybe 20 times a year. And we were like, and we broke it down how much that swimming pool was costing. It was beautiful. I mean, the backyard was gorgeous. It was waterfall thingy. And, and, and you know, before, But it was costing us $350 a month between the pool cleaner and all upkeep and the maintenance and the water. And and when you start adding up different things like that, like every car, every vehicle has expenses with it. Everything has expenses. Again, you go back to that cable. How often are you watching 5,000 channels? And how important is that? Um, So when you make that list of what's really important, what, what you're spending, and then you make another list of, okay, what do you really want to be doing with your time? Now, I'd love to travel. Travel is like high on my list. If I splurge, it's on travel. Um, and technology. I kind of like my computer. Um, so I have certain things that are important to me, but other things I could, uh, I'm not into a fancy kitchen. You know, some people have to have the latest and greatest appliance. That's not that important. So when you start deciding differences 
and what's important to you and what you're actually spending, you can decide where you can cut those things out. So we basically sold the bigger house. Um, um, we got out before the market crashed too bad. And we, we did have equity in it because we never went real crazy with a high mortgage. And we ended up buying a house free and clear. And our house is more modest than where we lived before. It was a thousand square feet less than where we lived before. And a lot of people said, oh, are you guys okay when we sold that house? You know how they were all like all worried that you were losing everything. You know? And we we're like, no, we're, we're going to try it. If we don't like it, we'll rent it and we'll buy something else. We can always do that. But we got so, um, the peace of mind that came from living in a house free and clear was amazing. <laughs> um, and I, I know not everybody has that resources. You know, we have been at this for a while. So like you said, we were building equity and we had the resources to buy a house, but it wasn't that expensive. And, and let's face it, the desert community where I live is a lot less expensive than living on the coast right now. Um, it's a lot harder to get into a, a, a home, even a modest home on the coast. Here we were able to do it, pay it off. We did um, all very sustainable stuff. We put solar on the roof. We did, um, you know, low water type everything for the property. So I can live in my house free and clear and pay taxes and insurance um, for less than $500 a month. And, and I couldn't live anywhere in the world for less than that because that's my utilities, that's my insurance, that's everything, and it's my house. Um, but, but it kind of goes back to the rich man, um, poor man kind of thing where he says a house is a cost. A house really isn't an asset, even though we'd like to think of it as it. Um, it's a cost. It's money going out. Your investments are money coming in. So everything that we... Um, buy as an investment, we look at the cash flow of what it can give us in terms of will it buy us the lifestyle that we want? And, and that's always been our approach. So, so does that kind of make it uh, explain how the, you know, the right sizing worked for us? Now, mm -hmm. I get, again, I get that we've had the advantage of, of time to build our equity so that we were able to get into this house. But I think a lot of people spend far more than they need to if they really want to get into investing and 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 shoot for the future it's a mindset it's kind of like once you get used to spending money you just keep spending it and when you decide to be more careful with your resources um it, the money's there we we figured by moving that move that we made into this house we're saving over, um the, probably $35,000 a year by moving into this house um, and it was just choosing a different lifestyle. And I, again, I don't feel it's a sacrifice. I feel like we really did something that was good for us. Yeah, that's great. So in, in the beginning, there may be a sacrifice because people will have to um, probably get financing and probably um, not get the cash flow. But over time, over time, especially today with low interest rates, uh, you will rents go up and and in 10, 20, 30 years, many of our listeners will be able to tell the same story you're, you're telling that over time, it really pays off if you're able to, to acquire with leverage, pay that down, um, get some equity. And then you've got the kind of choices that you're talking about where you can sell something and downside and trade off and kind of the cash flow game. Um, well, and I think I, I think I, uh, after listening to some of the other podcasts uh, from some of your speakers, I think you're very careful about trying not getting people into properties that can't um, cover themselves. You know, yeah, at least at there. least cover themselves, and that's yes. that's that's our goal because yeah. you don't want to be negative cash flow. Although I've interviewed people who do that, knowing that they they truly I don't like I don't advocate it. We've done it. I it didn't work. Um, but there are people who still choose that because they really believe that the area is going to grow in value. It's very speculative, but mm -hmm. we figure today, Hey, if you can at least have all your expenses covered, have someone pay off your debt for you while you're in an area that's growing and where prices will, will very likely appreciate, then, um, then you're moving in the right direction. Right. Well, and, and let's face it. I think, you know, if, if we're all honest, life is a trade-off. We have to decide what's important. And that means that you're going to have to choose something else. If, you know, if you like this a lot, you can't do everything in this. 
you have to say, okay, this is important to me, so I'm willing to give up this. One thing I forgot, though, because I had listened to some of your other podcasts, is how important it is to have the right spouse. Mm. Um, if, if you're not both on the same page, I can't. Uh, it would be very difficult to be perfectly yeah. on it. Tom and I are very well suited to each other. We had very similar values of what was important and where we wanted to go with it. And um, that makes it, oh, that makes a huge difference. I think, as you know, if you don't have that rela- relationship, um, synchronicity. Of mind, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I, I've, I've got, uh, you know, family members who, discovered that the spouse had all these credit cards they didn't know about and hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. So yeah, actually, absolutely. You're, when you choose your spouse, that is 50% of your finances. And if they're spending, that's 50% of your debt. And if they're oh, uh, yeah. saving, well then, you know, that's 50, 50% yours too. So it is so important to um, talk about your finances before you make that decision. Absolutely. <laughs> you should right size your relationships. I think that's you know I right size everything. <laughs> I love that. Well, Kathy, it's been a pleasure to have you here on the Real Wealth Show. Thank you so much for joining us. You're so welcome. I enjoyed this. And thank you for joining me here on the Real Wealth Show. You can learn how to create your own cash flowing real estate portfolio at realwealthshow.com. When you sign up, it's free. You'll get access to our learning center with hundreds of free webinars. And you'll also have access to our investor portal where you can see sample properties and connect with our network of resources, including investment counselors, property teams, lenders, 1031 exchange facilitators, CPAs, and other professionals recommended by our over 60,000 members. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast and leave a review. We really appreciate it. I'm Kathy Fetke, and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.